All right, so let's continue with our discussion uh, as we get into uh, financial accounting, kind of some chapter one type information. In our slide here, we have some characteristics of financial information. It says, uh, to be useful, financial reports must possess characteristics of relevance and faithful representation. Now, um, you say, well, wait a minute, we've already discussed relevance. Uh, and that's true because relevance and timeliness are objectives uh, of financial accounting uh, and financial reporting. Um, so, you know, if if that's an objective, then we can say that, well, relevance is also going to be a characteristic of financial information. So we've already covered that one. But let's just go over it again. It says relevant information has the potential to impact decision making. So trivial um, business facts such as a cash register drawer was $2 short for this shift on this day at this large multinational uh, retailer would not be considered relevant. Okay. Um, however, if we have a, a, a situation where the software for our retail chain is not working and it's causing all kinds of problems with our, uh, with our cash reconciliations on our cash registers across all of our locations, well, that is relevant information. Uh, it's important and it can impact decision making. A faithful representation right here it says means that information accurately reflects an entity's economic activity or condition. So what we're saying here when we talk about faithful representation is that the data contained in the financial statements um, is accurate as far as we know. Okay, so for example, we're going to get into some things, um, you know, later in the course where we talk about uh, adjustments to sales and allowances for accounts receivables and all of these types of things. And so, you know, I might tell you that uh, this company had a million dollars in sales and we estimate that, uh, you know, we estimate that there's going to be $25,000 in returns. So net sales are 975000 Well, let's say that, that, um, that returns end up being 30000 well, the fact that we we presented that and it wasn't exactly accurate is okay because we did our best. Uh, we used uh, established legal uh, procedures for our estimates. And um, if we faithfully represent data in our financial statements according to relevance and so forth, then we can say, okay, these may not be accurate to the penny, but um, they are more or less, these financial statements are more or less accurate and they have been put together in a faithful manner. All right, let's look at some assumptions of accounting. We've got four of them here. We're just going to go through these one by one. We've got monetary unit, time period, business entity, and going concern. So these are assumptions and we'll get into those and I think that this will uh, make pretty good sense to you. So when we talk about monetary unit assumption, let's see what it says. It says it requires that financial reports be expressed in a single monetary unit or currency. And so I want you to think about a large company like Amazon. Amazon is based in uh, Seattle, Washington, here in the United States, but it also has business activity throughout the world. And so what we are going to do with Amazon, because they are a United States company, is we're going to take all of their earnings worldwide and we're going to present that in U.S. dollars. So if we if Amazon has business that they make over in Great Britain, where the currency is more valuable than the U.S. dollar, that will be converted into the U.S. dollar. If Amazon makes sales um, 
in most other parts of the world. We'll just use Mexico as an example, um, where they deal in pesos. Um, that currency is worth far less than uh, U.S. currency. Those pesos will be converted into uh, U.S. dollars. Okay, and it says right here the monetary unit. Uh, used is normally determined by the country in which the company operates in terms of their headquarters. All right, so that's the monetary unit assumption. The time period assumption allows a company to report its economic activities on a regular basis for a specific period of time. Now, what that means if is if if I tell you that sales are for the year were two million dollars you know that the time period that we're talking about is that one year. Um, and this is very, very important. What we don't want to have, if, let's say that we run a business and we record our income based upon a calendar year, January 1 through December 31. You know, we want to make sure that um, in doing so, our sales are, are recorded from January 31 through December 31. We don't want any sales from the past few days of the prior year being counted, and we certainly don't want sales from the, the first few days of the next year being uh, counted. So whenever we say that here's our income statement and we made $2 million for the year, we are assuming that, in fact, that $2 million was earned uh, over that one year period. So that's time period assumption. We don't ask uh, investors and creditors to come in and and figure that out for themselves. Okay, this is an assumption that they should be allowed to make. The business entity assumption, let's read what this says. It says limits economic data and financial reports to that which directly is related to the activities of the business. Um, so what we're what we're talking about here, and this is um, this is a big problem sometimes with really really small businesses, um, but business you know figures in the uh, financial statements should be separate from personal expenses of the owners, um, creditors, or other businesses. All right. So if you own, let's just say that you own a uh, I don't know, let's say that you own a plumbing business and, uh, you know, you stop by you and let's say that you have a, a debit card that you use for this plumbing business and you stop by uh, Walmart and you buy some office supplies. Um, those office supplies need to be used for your business. OK, so when we eventually list that as an expense for that uh, plumbing business, uh, we need to be able to assume that all expenses, all revenues are re related to normal and ordinary business activities, that there's no uh, personal business intermingled uh, in those figures. And we also need to under, we also are, should be able to assume that we're dealing with one business and that we don't have uh, multiple businesses, particularly with regard to generating uh, revenue. Okay, so business entity assumption is one of business activities are separate from other uh, completely separate businesses and from personal uh, income and expenses unrelated to the business uh, whose activities are being reported. We also have what's called the going concern assumption. And basically what that says in a nutshell is that when we look at financial statements, we are we can make the assumption, unless we have information to the contrary, we can make the assumption that this business is going to continue to operate for the foreseeable future. All right, we do not have a business which is uh, about to go out of business. And think about this now. That's very, very important. Let's say that you have a business and you're planning on retiring and just close, shuttering the, the store that you own in a couple of months. And you go to the bank and ask for a big loan. Well, when that bank looks over your financial statements, they should be allowed to make the assumption that you are going to continue 
uh, on operating your business for the foreseeable future. All right, so those were four assumptions. Let's look at some principles. We've got measurement, historical cost, and then we have revenue recognition and expense recognition. All right, so those are four principles that we need to cover. It says here with the measurement principle, this principle determines the amount that will be recorded and reported. All right. So we've got some criteria that we have to look at here. It says the measurement principle requires that amounts be objective and verifiable. So what are we talking about here? We can be talking about just about anything. We can be talking about the purchase of assets for a business. We can be talking about uh, regular expenses. We can be talking about income. So it says here, um, that it is it is objective and it's verifiable and it's got some, some information here. It says an amount is objective if it is based upon independent, unbiased evidence. So you go and you're a business owner and you purchase something from a company. You have no ties to that company. In other words, you don't own that company also. They present you with an invoice. Um, that would be independent, unbiased evidence. And that amount is verifiable if it can be confirmed by a third party. In other words, you record an expense for $500, which is going to hit your income statement and reduce your income. You should, a third party, say for example, an auditor, for example, should be able to go in uh, and calculate your expenses and verify the amounts that you have. It says transactions between two independent parties called arm's length transactions provide the amounts that are objective and verifiable. Okay, so if we, if we, uh, let's say that we've made, we have a business and we've uh, made way too much money and we have a trailer that we're not using and we have a book value on that trailer of $10,000 and we sell it to our our cousin for $500 so that we can reduce our income tax expense for the year, that would not be considered an arm's length uh, transaction. Okay. So when we talk about assumptions, I want you to understand that those are more of a, of a big picture type item. These principles deal more uh, on a, on a, on a micro level um, view of transactions that are taking place within the business organization. All right, we also have what we call the historical cost principle or the cost principle. And that basically just says that we are going to record an item at its initial transaction price. So I said a, a moment ago, we were talking about this trailer that we bought for $10,000. Well, if we ad adhere to the historical cost principle and we paid, let's say that we paid $10,000 for that trailer, that is the amount at which we would record it um, as an asset. Okay, we wouldn't buy it for $10,000 and say, well, you know what, we overpaid by a little bit. It was really only worth $8,000, so we're going to record it at $8,000. Or, you know what, we paid $10,000, but it's really worth $20,000, so let's record this asset at $20,000. No, we paid $10,000 for it. That's what we're going to record uh, on the financial statements. All right. We also have what's called the revenue recognition principle. So at this time, I'd like to tell you there are two uh, distinct types of accounting. There are more than that, but um, we have in accounting what's called cash basis accounting, and we also have what's called accrual basis, and that's A-C-C-R-U-A-L, okay? And accrual basis accounting, and we're going to look at accrual basis in more detail as we go along, but it basically says that Revenue is recognized when it is earned, not necessarily when 
the actual money is received. So think about this. Let's say that um, you have a lawn mowing service and you go around and you and you um, uh, you mow lawns and people pay you. Now you're probably going to be a you're probably going to operate that on a cash basis, okay? But for purposes of our little example, I think it'll be okay if we use the lawn mowing service. Um, and let's say that you you generally mow this lawn and you trim the the yard and so forth, and you're paid fifty dollars. And one of your clients is going to be out of town for a vacation, and you mow the lawn. Um, and you're not going to be paid for that lawn until they get back. All right. Well, according to the revenue recognition principle, once you have mowed that lawn, you, in this case, would have $50 of revenue, even though you haven't yet received the money. Why? Because you have earned the revenue. You've provided the service, therefore, um, the revenue is been earned. Okay, and this is the same thing if you were to sell, uh, like we talked about the trailer, let's say that you uh, you you sell the trailer and you you allow the person to pay you uh, in one month. Okay, well, let's say that you sell that trailer in the month of December and one month later it's going to be a whole new year. Well, that revenue recognition would be for the month of December because that's when you earned it not in January when you actually receive the cash. All right. All right. Uh, principles uh, continued. We have the expense recognition principle, uh, sometimes called the matching principle. And let's just read what it says here. It says requires expenses to be recorded in the same period as the related revenue. Okay. So basically, this is another example of accrual basis accounting. When we incur the expense, that is when we owe. Let's go back to our lawn mowing example. And now let's say in, instead of it being a um, an individual lawn, let's say that we own an apartment complex and we have an outside independent lawn service that comes in and they, uh, they mow the grass, uh, trim all around the, the areas in the parking lot and stuff where there's grass and so forth. Uh, do all of that kind of stuff, and we pay them once a month, all right? So um, now probably not going to be doing a lot of lawn mowing in December, but maybe we're in a cold environment, and let's just, let's change it from mowing to, uh, let's say, snow removal uh, or, or some type of maintenance expense with regard to keeping the, uh, uh, you know, the sidewalks, uh, clear of ice and that's that sort of thing. Okay, well, this service comes in, they provide the service. We're going to recognize that expense when they do the work. Why? Because we, I said we were, we had a, an apartment complex. We're renting out apartments. Okay, and so um, part of that rent that we receive, part of that that rental price that we charge. Uh, is for common area maintenance, all right? So it would make sense that if we incurred that expense in December, that we record that expense in December, even if we don't pay it until the month of January. All right, so we had four assumptions and four principles of accounting. Let's stop this video and we'll get another one up shortly.